Hey everyone, today we're going to finish up our discussion of kinematics with a little lecture on material and spatial integration along with Reynolds transport relation. We've um, already kind of discussed most of what we're going to talk about for material and spatial integration in one way or other, um, <coughs> but we'll do it officially here since there's a chapter on it in the textbook but we already really did this when we talked about deformation of volume and curves and areas. Right, so although the process that's taking place lives in the spatial configuration, you know, that's the only, <clears throat> that's where everything actually exists, you know. The reference configuration is a nice handy tool for doing calculations, but, um, the material actually occupies the spatial configuration. So if we wanted to, say, find the overall momentum of it, we would want to integrate the density times the velocity in the spatial configuration over the body. Um, because that would actually be what the momentum is. <clears throat> but when we go to do the math, sometimes it's more convenient to do a change of variable and integrate that in the reference configuration. Or go back and forth a couple times in order to prove that something is equal to something else. So we want to be able to carry out integrals <coughs> of spatial quantities using um, either the spatial configuration or the reference configuration. So start off with line integrals, and we've already done this, but we'll do it again here because it's in the chapter and just for completeness. So here we go. So let's say we have a spatial curve that convects with the body, so there's a corresponding material curve, and um, a spatial vector field U. So given <clears throat> so C sub T convects with the body. And it'll have a corresponding material curve, C. And of course, C is in the reference body. <laughs> and a spatial vector field U. Then let's say that we have the integral over the spatial curve, CT of U of x and t <clears throat> dot the tangent vector to the curve. Well, <clears throat> ct could be parameterized by little x of t, which is going to be the map to the spatial configuration of the single parameterization of the reference curve. So that's one that we've already talked about. So we'll say that is equal to the integral from lambda naught <clears throat> to lambda one of u of x hat, which is our parameterization of the curve, x hat sub t of lambda, and u is also a function of t. And then that is also times 
you know, the, the inner product, the partial derivative of x hat <coughs> sub t of lambda. So here it's a partial derivative because x hat is a function of both t and lambda. Partial lambda. And then the integration variable d lambda. All right, well, we can use the parameterization of the reference configuration curve. So if we want to go back to the reference configuration, that is equal to u. Well, the integration again from lambda naught <coughs> to lambda 1. Now it is u. If we're going to use the reference configuration parameterization, which is not a function of time. But u is a function of time, so it is this point and this time. Um, you know, we, we could really write that as u chi t x hat lambda and t. Um, <clears throat> that's really what we mean there. But I wrote it in my notes this way. And we've talked about you can use either material or spatial points as the arguments for the field. It doesn't really matter. It's only when you start taking derivatives. So understand that those two are meant to mean the same thing here. All right, so then that is dot. <clears throat> oh, that won't dot anything because it's the laser pointer tool. All right, well, this whole thing here, the partial derivative, this partial derivative here is going to be f times the derivative of the parameterized x with respect to lambda in the reference configuration. So the u is the same. And we're going to take that and make it f x hat <coughs> of lambda and t acting on the time independent derivative of the parameterization of this curve in the reference configuration. All right, so that is equal to <coughs> the integral over the material curve of u dot f dx, <coughs> which is equal to the integral over the material curve of f transpose u dot dx, if you would prefer that way. <coughs> so the integral that we're calculating um, remains this integral of u dot dx in the spatial configuration. Um, so maybe that is like the, if it's a closed curve, maybe that's the amount that things swirling if u is the velocity. You know, that could be the circulation around it. Um, <clears throat> but here we've taken this expression that lives entirely in the spatial configuration, and we've come up with a way to calculate it using things that live <clears throat> in the reference configuration um, because it might be easier. An example of one that would be easier is if you go to make, say, a finite element method for nonlinear solid mechanics, you would 
want your grid to be of the reference configuration because then the grid wouldn't have to deform even though your <clears throat> space does or your your body does but if you leave your grid in the reference configuration then everything remains nice and all of your elements remain with like nice planar faces and everything so that's one very practical reason why you might want to do your integration <clears throat> in the reference configuration instead of the spatial one And the trick to going between the two is there's going to be some business involving F or its transpose or its inverse, depending on <clears throat> what you're trying to do. All right, so if we have a material region P, so that P sub T, which is the image of that under the deformation, is a spatial region convecting with the body, which we'll draw out here. So we'll draw that for <clears throat> visualizations purposes or old time's sake or whatever. Here we go. It's always nice to draw a potato. Must be my Irish heritage. <clears throat> All right, so here is our material body, non script EP. And here is its boundary, dp. And here is some point x, which is in the boundary. And so it has an associated unit normal, n hat r of x. <coughs> Right, if, if x here was not a boundary point, then there is no such thing as the unit normal, since uh, normal to what? All right, so then at some time t, this whole thing squishes substantially, evidently. to um, the deformed configuration. So this here is script dp of t, the spatial body. It has boundary d p of t. And we have our material point x in the boundary is equal to chi t of x, <clears throat> and here is our unit normal to the surface there. So we've really already established in the section on deformation of volume and area how integrals or Differential area elements and volume elements in this relate to ones over here. So let's kind of write those out. Can we? There we go. I don't know that that's actually going to help us much. There we go.
So the first one is some small volume delta V <coughs> in the spatial configuration is equal to <coughs> the determinant of the deformation gradient times the corresponding volume in the reference configuration plus things that vanish faster than the volume in the reference configuration. Let's see if we can move that over a little bit. Just like gerrymandered that comma out of there. That was pretty skilled. And then an area vector, so an area normal vector, we'll call it delta A. Well, that goes with the cofactor tensor of the deformation gradient acting on the corresponding area normal vector in the reference configuration plus things that ver or go to zero more quickly than the area magnitude <coughs> in the reference configuration. And so certainly when we are talking about a differential volume, then boy, that part's really unimportant if we're talking about a differential one, then of course that goes away. And same thing for a differential area, it's just gonna be that, um, you know, where d vector a would be n hat, the unit normal times d scalar a, and d a r, would be an r hat, the, the unit normal in the reference configuration, times d a r, the scalar area. Um, so those will go away. <clears throat> All right, so if we talk about integrating a scalar, perhaps the density over the volume in the spatial configuration, boy, that sounds like that would give you the mass of something, huh? Probably come in handy for the balance laws section, I bet you. Come on. Kind of hard to know whether. <laughs> nope. All right, I think that gives us the whole page there. All right, so then we have the integral over the body in the deformed configuration. Well, of, I suppose, a spatially convecting region, so not necessarily the whole body, of phi times the differential volume is equal to the integral over that corresponding reference <coughs> volume of phi times j, the Jacobian determinant, which is the determinant of f, times d v r for any phi any scalar vector or tensor field. So phi equals rho gives mass rho v gives momentum, rho, we'll call it epsilon, what that would be, say, total mechanical energy would give the, well, total mechanical energy per unit mass gives total energy, <clears throat> like an extensive quantity. Uh, contained 
in the body in the deformed configuration. <clears throat> so you can already see how that's going to come in handy. Um, and especially with like solid mechanics where we can, or rather where we will express the say stress constitutive relation relative to the reference configuration, right? That's what your strain's gonna be. Um, so you're, you're often going to wanna talk about your stuff in the reference configuration because that's how you formulate your stress from your deformation. But the momentum and mass and everything, they're always gonna live in the spatial configuration. So this is how we're going to relate the two kinds of integration to uh, get the same quantity. All right, so we get a couple useful things from this. First, the integral over the boundary of phi n hat dA in the <clears throat> spatial configuration is equal to the integral over the boundary in the material configuration of phi f cofactor and r d <coughs> a r, which is, you know, exactly what we established here. Just like this is from there. <coughs> the integral over the boundary in the spatial configuration of a vector field u dot n dA <coughs> is equal to the integral over the boundary in the reference configuration of u dot f cofactor, which is determinant of f, f inverse transpose, and r <coughs> dAr, which also you can show pretty easily is equal to that same integral of the determinant of f, f inverse u dot nr d a r. <clears throat> Taking a second to look at this, u we said is a spatial vector field. So that's good because nr is a material vector field and f inverse is going to take spatial vector fields and spit out a material vector field. So that's good because that means we can actually take this inner product, right? It doesn't make any sense to talk about the inner product of a spatial vector field with a reference configuration vector field. All right, and then finally we got the integral over the boundary of some tensor field G n that at the very least has to take arguments of spatial vector fields and spit out something. So it could either be a spatial vector field or a mixed, or spatial tensor field or a mixed tensor field, G here. dA is equal to the integral in the reference configuration of, well, we're gonna write out our JF inverse transpose for F cofactor, but understand that this is F cofactor. So J, G, F inverse transpose, and R, D, A, R, <clears throat> and the last one, U dot G N D A is equal to the integral in the reference configuration of U dot oopsies. So we'll just leave G F cofactor and R 
D-A-R. All right, the next one is the localization theorem. Um, we use that a whole lot. It's pretty uh, useful and pretty obvious looking at it. Um, it relies on the things we're talking about being continuous over the domain of interest, but that's it. <coughs> So basically, if the integral of something has to be zero or strictly non-negative over any arbitrary reason, then that quantity has to be zero everywhere, provided that the um, argument of the integral is continuous. <clears throat> and I'll show you what I mean by that at least visually um, and you can prove it in like a formal mathematical real analysis sort of sense without too much extra effort but being engineers um, probably given you a visual justification of why it'll be just as good um, because in engineering land most of the you know, formal mathematical proofs, at least when we're talking about finite dimensional things with continuous functions. Um, if you can visualize the situation that's going to guide you in the right direction, usually, that's not going to necessarily be the case if you start talking about things that aren't vector spaces or function spaces that aren't infinite dimensions. But that's not what this is right here. All right, so say we know that phi is a smooth scalar function. Actually, we can just say continuous. Scalar field. And we know that phi has to equal zero for any arbitrary subregion of the material body, the integral of it. We know that the integral over P V dvr is equal to zero for all p that are subsets of the reference body. Well, this is going to tell us that phi has to equal zero everywhere. like that. <clears throat> um, and, and so this is tied intimately to the fact that phi is continuous. So because phi is continuous, you know, let's say if we do a little 1D example. Okay, so here is the x-axis is our reference body B. It's 1D, so we can do this, right? We say just from the left side to the right side, we parameterized it, made it a straight line. And here is phi of x. So I suppose this here is actually x. In B, where B is one-dimensional, all right, well, let's say 
So we sure can't have it be, you know, if, if phi is, say, that right there, and then a zero everywhere else. Let's give ourselves a couple of different colors to work with so we don't get too confused. Um, all right, so like if phi does one of these, you know, clearly, like we're kind of boned um, because you could pick this bit here and phi integrates to something bigger than zero if, you know, we make this section p or it's something that's less than zero if we make that p, even if the thing integrates to zero over all of b. Um, but also because phi is continuous, we can't be like, well, you know, it can be something right there, but zero everywhere else. That doesn't work because there's always going to be that little tiny triangle around it. And, you know, it's going to, if we pick P as just this little subset where it's positive, well, that's going to integrate to something that is, you know, it's, it might be darned small, but it's not going to be zero. So, you know, it's like when Jack Sparrow says, but you have heard of me. Same deal. So, you know, if, if it integrates to zero over every subregion and it's continuous, then it has to be zero everywhere. And it's going to turn out that the same thing holds for, like, if it is greater than or equal to zero, so strictly non-negative, if it always has to be strictly non-negative, so an example of that would be, like, the entropy production inequality, then, you know, it, it has to be non-negative everywhere. Or you could find somewhere where it is negative and pick a really small region around it, and it would break it. All right, so the localization theorem has four different forms that are going to be relevant to us. The first one we just showed, the integral over the reference body, V d v r equals zero for all p in b implies that phi is equal to zero for all x in b. The same thing, but with an inequality. Uh, we'll say greater than or equal to. Less than or equal to would also apply here. And then we have the same two things in the deformed configuration. All right, so the next one, which we use a lot, um, and if you do fluid mechanics, so you use it a lot, er, is called the Reynolds transport relation. All right, so if P sub T is a materially convecting spatial region, and that notation in our class in the textbook is always going to imply a materially convecting spatial region, 
So then the time derivative of the integral of phi integrated over that volume is equal to, this is going to use one of the <clears throat> formulas that we made back here. Um, in fact, this fancy looking one. That's going to be the integral over the material body of phi times the volumetric Jacobian d v r time derivative of that whole mess. So basically, the the trouble is that like we have this um, deforming region, and it can be expanding, contracting, whatever. Um, now, there can't be any flux of material across its boundary, but, you know, phi might be something besides material. I don't know. Maybe phi is the pressure that can do. Pressure doesn't convect with the material. The pressure is just the pressure. All right, so that we can do, you know, in the reference configuration. So we, we want to talk about how we move basically the time derivative from outside to inside <clears throat> the integral. Um, and because of nasty deforming things, this turns out not to be equal to the integral of phi dot, uh, specifically because dv is changing, is the long and short of it. Um, Right, you look at this and it's like, well, why wouldn't it? And it's like, ah, because dv has the time derivative. That's, that's really what's going on here. Um, all right, so on, on this side, on the other hand, well, this one does not have a time derivative because the reference configuration is simply what it is. But sure enough, phi and j have time derivatives, and j dot is related to dv dot over there. All right, so this one is easy enough to do with the product rule. This is equal to the integral over the reference body, phi dot j plus phi j dot d v r. Uh, some time ago, we proved that the time derivative of j, j being the determinant of f, is equal to div v times j. Um, I'm stipulating that we proved this, but I would encourage you to, if you don't recall the proof for it, go find it, go prove it yourself, go find it in the textbook and read it. You know, never take anything at face value in your career, and it'll, it'll go a long way for you. All right. Or maybe not at face value, but don't just like take anything that is an equation that can be proven and trust it to be true without investigating it yourself. Because you'd be surprised how little some other people out there will do. Like if I hadn't told you guys that the product of a symmetric tensor and a symmetric tensor didn't have to be symmetric. If I just said that it did, would you have believed me? You might have. So that's, you know, that's the kind of thing that you can investigate, and you should always prove whatever you possibly can, because then, then you know that that's not where the problem is when your theory doesn't work. All right, so over the reference body, that is the integral over P of phi dot, we're going to factor out the j, um, plus <clears throat> phi div v times j dvr. Well, all right, j dvr, that gives us dv in the spatial configuration. So that is equal to the integral over the deformed body now of 
phi dot plus phi div v dv. And so that is equal to the integral over the def Ugh, that's ugly. Over the deformed body of phi prime, the partial derivative with respect to time holding spatial position fixed, plus grad phi dot v plus phi div v dv. And so we can kind of combine these two is equal to the integral over the body of, well, specifically over the spatial configuration there. Partial phi, partial t, plus the divergence of phi v dv. All right, so if you're like a, um, you know, fluid mechanics person like I am, specifically a CFD method developer, that's like, yeah, that's what we like to see there is, you know, the, right, because you can split that up then into So we like to see that because, you know, phi v, that's what we would call a, a flux. And we're taking the divergence of a flux and it's not multiplied by anything. So this would be called a conservation law form. And uh, <clears throat> those of us who do, say, finite volume or finite difference CFD methods, you know, we get pretty neurotic about things being in that form because things break numerical methods when they aren't. So... We like to see that. All right, the last little bit here is isochoric motion. So a motion is called isochoric if it preserves the volume of convecting regions, particularly of all convecting regions. All right, so the, that means that the volume doesn't change with time. So it's time derivative is zero. So volume PT, it's time derivative, is equal to the integral over the body of just one dV, right? That is equal to zero for all materially convecting regions Bt with Pt is equal to chi P T for a fixed P in B. All right, well, we can put the kind of implied one in there and do our whole dealy. So the time derivative of one dV integrated over this spatially convecting region is equal to the integral over that spatially convecting region of one dot plus one div V dv, well, the time derivative of 1, that's 0. So that is equal to the integral 
<clears throat> over the spatially convecting region of div v dv is equal to zero, and that is for any pt, uh, for all pt equals, oh, well, we'll say width equals chi p and t uh, for all p and b. So, For an isochoric motion, the divergence of the velocity has to equal zero. Well, if the divergence of the velocity is zero, then j dot is equal to div v times j is equal to 0 times j is equal to 0. So the following are equivalent. First, the motion is isochoric. Second, j dot is equal to zero, so the volumetric Jacobian does not change. And third, the divergence of velocity is equal to zero for all space and for all time. All right, that wraps up uh, our discussion of kinematics, so that's pretty exciting. We're going to get into basic mechanical principles next, um, <clears throat> you know, probably tomorrow. So the homework's due Friday. Um, I see like three or four people already turned it in. Had a couple questions during office hours yesterday. Met with another student today. Um, didn't seem that anyone had like terrible conceptual problems, so that made me feel pretty good about the state of things. Um, really optimistic that the homeworks will reflect the same. So, uh, yeah, that's about it. I'm going to be posting some lectures next week. I know it's uh, Thanksgiving break. I forget whether the university is doing an actual break next week or if it's only Thursday and Friday with the whole COVID uh, thing. But I don't really care to bother looking it up either. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'm going to post things next week, but, you know, that's, there's not going to be anything due next week. So don't feel like you have to spend your time off listening to me ramble on about continuum mechanics. Um, you know, you can watch them the next week or whatever. I'm going to start posting another homework that will be due fairly soon. We're going to have two more. Uh, someone had asked me whether we're going to do eight assignments. No, we're probably not. We're probably going to do six. All right. Have a good one. Catch you later.